Greetings from the World Ethanol and Biofuels Conference in Brussels. I'm joined by Eric Sievers from Ethanol Europe. How are you doing, Eric? Very good. How about you? Okay. Yes, well, uh, I think we should get uh, kicked off by talking about policy in Europe. So if you look at the uh, recent EU bioeconomy strategy, the Renewable Energy Directive 2, what are the shortcomings in your opinion? Uh, the shortcomings are really what we've seen all decade, which is a... Uh, a a feeling that there's something bad about uh, actually growing things and about agriculture. Uh, and this has been completely rebutted both by what we actually see in agricultural markets and also in October the International Environment Agency dedicated mm -hmm. its annual review of renewables to bioenergy uh, and made very clear that almost all of the arguments against bioenergy are not founded in any rational uh, science or arguments. It's really an aesthetic. And that false aesthetic is what really powers the EU bioeconomy strategy instead of a robust understanding of agriculture, agricultural markets, agricultural problems. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a disconnect. If you look at recent IEA reports, at the IPCC report, they both emphasize a massive scale up in bioenergy. And I don't think we're seeing the same thing on the European level, uh, yeah, policy level. That, that's exactly right. In fact, um, the, the greatest disconnect is between the European rhetoric of being leaders in all things renewable and all things climate. And a report like this uh, recent IEA report, which made clear that the only region of the world that actually has decreasing amounts of renewables in the transport sector is likely to be Europe in the coming years. And um, you're an American, but you're working in Europe. Is there anything that you think when you look at how biofuels policy is done in the US and how it's done in Europe, is there anything Europe could learn from the US? Uh, yeah, it seems strange to say as an American that you could learn something from America these days. Um, but certainly in, in biofuels, there's a lot to learn. Uh, the first lesson is these very abstract, uh, difficult uh, causation chain arguments about something being potentially maybe dangerous or wrong. Uh, these need to be taken with a grain of salt. So uh, in America, those kind of arguments uh, never really got as much traction, and that's good because in America today, you see with the corn ethanol uh, industry, you see less acres under uh, corn today the, than there was 100 years ago. Um, you see more exports of corn and corn products like distiller's grains than you had uh, 20 years ago. So there isn't any displacement of land or crops for biofuels. This is all just extra production. This is sustainable intensification, getting more out of the same acre uh, with fewer inputs, so a lower GHG footprint. And that was all created because there was an investable environment. Farmers believed that this biofuel policy would actually be adhered to. So farmers invested in their land. And that, that link of getting farmers to invest in their land, that's what's entirely missing from Europe. So in Europe, there's been no reason for farmers to, to invest. And so you see the gap in productivity uh, between America and, and Europe just growing every year. And in Europe, we like to say that, oh, that's because of uh, the scale of the farms in the U.S. and multinationals and GMO and the like, but that's actually not the reason. It's a very simple thing of farmers in Europe have no reason to invest in their land. I want to pick you up on one of the things you mentioned there, which was uh, land displacement. I think that might be behind the focus on cellulosic ethanol in Europe. Is this the right approach in your opinion, and how far away are we from achieving some kind of expansion of cellulosic ethanol. Um, you're, you're exactly right. So there's a, there's a continuing trend in Europe for whenever something is good, if there's anything that might be bad about it, then to look for something else. The end result of that is making something out of thin air so there's no externalities. Of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, but on cellulosic, yes, certainly there's a, uh, a feeling that it must be better than crop-based biofuels if uh, it uses residues, which are equated to waste, which is wrong. Um, but the problem is that there is no, there's less cellulosic production in Europe now than there was two years ago or three years ago. And currently the biofuel markets around the world have lots of supply and low prices. 
And the initial arguments about cellulosic being incredibly cheap were just plain wrong. They were just absolutely wrong. There may be low uh, actual production costs, not necessarily lower than first generation fuels, but there's huge capex and that capex needs to be recovered. So at least for 10 or 20 years, there need to be, frankly, fairly high biofuel prices. By talking against first generation biofuels and limiting the demand for those, you push down the prices of those fuels and therefore you make cellulosic completely unbankable, completely uninvestable. So today, if someone were producing large amounts of cellulosic, they wouldn't be able to get enough money for their product to justify their investment. And that's the fundamental issue, is that there isn't any sort of real competition between cellulosic and conventional, or any sort of advanced biofuels and conventional biofuels, but you need to have a robust and healthy and growing conventional market in order to have the kind of price signals you need to get advanced. Excellent. Thanks very much for your time, Eric. Sure. Okay.